Hi, I'm Dr. Patrick Krupka. I'm a chiropractor and I'm a functional medicine specialist. I'm also the author of a book called Six Simple Blood Tests That Can Change Your Life. So on today's video, what we're going to be talking about, you can tell we're getting into some interesting biochemical stuff here. Um, I've been finding lately I've had several male patients come in and they all have questions about do they have low testosterone, what are the symptoms of low testosterone, um, it, what's the right way to get it tested, should I do testosterone replacement therapy, lots of questions about that. So I find that I end up going through the discussion I'm going to have with you here today on a very regular basis. So I decided, that's generally how I decide to do these things, I decided it's time to make a video about male hormones, testosterone, when it's high and low, how we determine that, um, and how you can kind of be better armed to make the decision about whether or not you need hormone replacement therapy. So let me, a little disclaimer right up front, I don't do hormone replacement therapy. Uh, and I'm not gonna bash it, there's a time and a place for it. But you, you need to understand how to tell the difference between when you need testosterone and when there's something else going on. So we're gonna go through uh, the, the pathways or the cascade that exists in, in the male body to create testosterone, among other things. Because testosterone does not exist in a vacuum. All right, the first part of this chart, you'll notice right up here we start with cholesterol. Yes, I said the C word, cholesterol. Cholesterol is not all bad. All right, in fact, it, not much of it is bad. We'll talk about that briefly. That's a whole other video. I'll tell you where to get information on that. But we need cholesterol in our body. You can tell, and, and you'll know more as we go through this, the entire rest of this cascade depends on you having an appropriate amount of cholesterol in your body. Now, real briefly, because some of you are freaking out already, cholesterol is not really just good or bad, right? We talk about good and bad cholesterol being HDL and LDL cholesterol. But there are purposes for both HDL and LDL cholesterol in our body. Really, when it gets right down to it, if you're talking about a cardiovascular risk, you want to look at the size of the LDL particles that you have floating around. Generally speaking, the larger the particles, the less troublesome they are. The smaller the particles, the more problematic they can be. So you look for a ratio of particle size. There are ways to test it. Um, some of the more forward-thinking cardiologists out there are doing it. Functional medicine doctors do it. Maybe someday, if I'm ambitious enough, I'll make a video about it for you. But not all cholesterol is bad. You have to have it. Okay? You make vitamin D out of it. The list goes on. But you don't make any of these hormones without cholesterol. That's the beginning of it. Now, cholesterol becomes pregnenolone in this cascade. Pregnenolone has a choice to go one of two different directions. Now, during stress responses, it tends to move down this pathway and become cortisol. Okay, these are called mineral corticoids over here. When they're, well, let me, let me back up. During an initial stress response, it will actually split and go both ways. You will have an increase of, of activity in this pathway here and an increase in DHEA levels. But as that stress continues for a prolonged period of time, you will generally sacrifice DHEA production to push the stress-related pathway over here. All right, so generally speaking, stress pathway, non-stress pathway. I'm oversimplifying this, so all of you biochemists that like to watch my videos and make little comments, it's great, I understand, this is, this is simplified, okay? Now, we're not talking much about this pathway up here today. If you wanna know about this, you can go back and watch my adrenal physiology videos. There are three of those out there. They will explain what goes on here. Where cholesterol becomes pregnenolone, progesterone, aldosterone, cortisol, and even where it becomes DHEA, and to some degree the next one we're going to talk about, that all takes place in the adrenal glands. Okay, there's some crossover uh, with the gonads, which are going to be ovaries in women, testes in men. Obviously today we're talking more about men, so we'll be talking about testes. There's some overlap when you get in here as to where the production occurs. But generally think of this, this top section and mostly the DHEA is being produced in the adrenal glands. Now, from DHEA, uh, from DHEA, let me go on with this way. From DHEA, you produce something called androstenedione. Now, it didn't fit in the box, so I just wrote andro. You'll hear it pronounced androstenedione or androstenedione. 
from what I can tell, either one is correct. It just depends on who you're, who you're speaking to. So DHEA becomes androstenedione. You'll notice this arrow from progesterone. If you have lost some of your DHEA production, but you're pushing this stress pathway up here, you can get some conversion of progesterone into androstenedione and still run some of this. It's not the preferred path. And it tends to happen um, during stress responses and when there is what we call insulin resistance, all right, where you don't react appropriately to insulin, so you have to make more and more of it. High sugar diets, high refined carbohydrate diets, those are going to push you through this pathway into androstenedione. But either way you get there, all right, we're going to start with androstenedione and work our way through. So from androstenedione, now we're crossing over into a process that takes place more likely in the testes. Okay, there's still a little adrenal crossover here. But androstenedione has a reversible reaction to become testosterone. Notice that arrow goes both directions. That will become important later on. Now we're finally creating testosterone. All of this had let, has finally led us to creating testosterone. Once we have testosterone, it does not always stay as testosterone. Testosterone can go downstream and become dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, and both androstenedione and testosterone can overflow, so to speak, and we'll talk about how this happens in a minute, and become estrogen. Estrone and estradiol are both estrogens. There's a third estrogen. There's a reason I didn't put it on this chart. We'll get to that. So that's the basic production and metabolism of testosterone. Now, why does all this matter, right? If you're low in testosterone, take testosterone, everything should feel better. Sometimes, not always. Let's talk a little bit about these two arrows right here. These arrows, each of these arrows, by the way, represents an enzyme, okay? Each time you have, um, like, progesterone becoming aldosterone, there's a mechanism somewhere biochemically that makes that conversion, and that's generally governed by one or a group of enzymes, okay? And there are certain nutrients that come in here and, and push that reaction. So when we're talking about these two enzymes here, these are aromatase enzymes. There are medications that work to stop the effectiveness of those. But, but there are things that promote the activity of aromatase enzymes. Um, high percentage of body fat tends to do that. A high sugar diet, insulin resistance, high stress situations, all of those tend to push the aromatase enzyme activity, which means you're going to start to convert your androstenedione and testosterone into estrogen. That's not a great thing, right? We're looking for testosterone, we're converting it into estrogen. Estrogen is, uh, I can't really say it's opposite of testosterone, it's not black and white like that, but think of it as estrogen being the female androgen, testosterone is the male androgen, okay? This, this is to females what testosterone is to males. All right, that's, that's a, a simplistic way to think of it. Well, if you're a male who wants to maximize the effectiveness of testosterone, you don't want to have a ton of estrogen floating around. So you want to avoid behaviors and lifestyle choices that push that conversion into estrogen. Now, let's say you're in a situation, and a lot of guys are, you're overweight, you can't gain lean muscle mass, you keep losing the lean muscle mass, you don't have enough energy to go work out, you're stressed out, you're on a high refined sugar diet, you're going to be pushing these, and you're going to have all of the symptoms of low testosterone. What if I were to look at your chart, and we just tested testosterone, and that's low, because it's all leaking into estrogen. So we look at that, and we say, well, you know what, let's give them some testosterone. If we give you testosterone, what's to keep that testosterone that we gave you from following the same path that your natural testosterone followed that left you low in the first place? Now you're riding the gas and the brakes when you take testosterone. You increase your testosterone levels, but you also in turn increase your estrogen levels. That doesn't necessarily fix the problem. You can see the trouble there. Now, let's take a different pattern. What if you are someone who, let's say, has low DHEA and low androstenedione, and therefore there's nothing to become testosterone, or there's not enough to become testosterone, and that's left you with low testosterone? Well, if we give you a bunch of testosterone, you may feel considerably better. But remember, this is a reversible reaction. 
that testosterone can kind of backfeed and become androstenedione. Not necessarily bad, but androstenedione is not going to become testosterone at that point because you have it already, right? You're taking it. So androstenedione is going to go down here and become estrogen. That can also become the stronger estrogen, which is estradiol. So you can see that testosterone does not exist on its own. One more thing to mention, DHT, dihydrotestosterone, you'll hear a lot about this. When DHT gets high, it is very common for that to cause mm, male hormone deficiency symptoms. Let's talk about how it does that for a second. DHT is actually a stronger androgen than, than testosterone is to begin with. But DHT will bind to those testosterone receptors about 10 times stronger than testosterone does. And so when you start building up too much DHT, that's implicated in prostate swelling, male pattern baldness, any number of issues. And that also tends to go high in the same lifestyle conditions that push the estrogens high. If you are one that easily produces DHT from your testosterone, taking more testosterone is going to create more DHT. So I don't want to discourage you necessarily from, from doing testosterone. I want to discourage you from blindly wandering in to taking supplemental testosterone. I recommend to all of my male patients, I would say after age 40, 35 if you've got issues, you should start looking at this cascade periodically and know your patterns, figure out how to change your lifestyle to create the appropriate patterns so you don't run into that situation. Now, once you're in that situation, if you're going to do testosterone replacement, I think it's very important to know this information so that you can somewhat predict what's going to happen when you add testosterone to your system. If you know where it's leaking, you know when you put testosterone in, it's going to leak in the same places. Plug the leaks before you take the testosterone or see a functional medicine doctor that knows how to kind of rehabilitate portions of this system and knows how to change lifestyle factors and dietary factors so that you are retaining and producing your own testosterone and likely won't even need testosterone supplementally to begin with. Now, another issue I want to address, I don't want to overload you, but I think it's important to mention. Many people ask questions, and I get the questions quite frequently, if I take supplemental testosterone or if I take supplemental DHEA, which people love to just dole out like it's candy, can that increase my risk of prostate cancer or prostate symptoms? The answer is yes and no to me. Now, this is my opinion. When you look at the research that's out there, some of the studies say yes, some of the studies say no. All right, so, so we're left in this, this neutral position of saying there's probably no correlation or we can't find a correlation yet. But let me put a little more perspective to this for you. You'll understand where I get my opinion from. If you are someone, let's say, that converts a lot of their testosterone and androstenedione into estrogens, the more estrogen you have, the more likely you are to have prostate symptoms. Okay? And whether you take that down the road to prostate cancer or not, okay. But prostate symptoms, we'll just be generic about this. If you are someone who tends to overflow like that and you add a bunch of DHEA and you start pushing this whole cascade, you are going to take whatever products this cascade makes already and you're going to accentuate those. So if this cascade is pushing you toward prostate issues to begin with, if you take more DHEA, you're just going to push it more quickly. Likewise, if you're taking testosterone, and you were one that turned it into detrimental products, relatively detrimental products, and we give you more testosterone, you are likely going to create those. If that, if that profile increases your risk of prostate issues, you just increase your risk of prostate issues. Now, if I'm doing a study and I take a thousand random men, some of them are going to have that physiology, others are not. So when you look at the statistics surrounding that study, it says, eh, well, some of them had problems, some of them didn't. It wasn't statistically significant either way. But if they were to look at this ahead of time and separate those subjects into groups that had that kind of physiology and groups that didn't, you might see a much more clear relationship, and we may actually develop screening protocols to avoid that. 
Why they don't do the research that way, your guess is as good as mine. Okay? But they don't, or they haven't yet. Maybe they will now that I did this. So pass it along to all your researcher friends. So anyway, I wanted to go over this with you. I wanted you to get a general overview of it. There are much more um, intricate relationship issues in here that a good functional medicine doctor can ferret out for you and help you figure out whether you're a good candidate for testosterone therapy or not, whether you're actually low in testosterone or whether you're just high in estrogen, whether you're shunting everything down this stress pathway and you need some adrenal rehab so you can go through this part of it. There are lots of options. But I encourage you to find a doctor that knows how to do this testing, knows how to interpret it and get it done. If you have a functional medicine doctor that, that's not familiar with this, this test that I'm representing here, minus a couple of pieces, uh, comes from a lab called Diagnostex. Now there are other labs that do saliva testing for hormones like this and, and they're generally pretty accurate. The reason I use Diagnostex is because they put their information in a flowchart format like you're seeing here. And when I present that to a patient and explain it to them, instead of just seeing a list of hormones and them trying to get some abstract concept of what those are and what they do, they see it in flowchart form with all the arrows and, and relationships and it just makes sense to them. So if you are a patient, I would recommend getting a test that's going to make sense to you. You can also take that to your urologist, your family doctor, your endocrinologist, and it should make perfect sense to them as well. All right, so that's why I use Diagnostex. If you wanna get in touch with them, you can Google Diagnostex. Um, you can go through my website and find reference to them, or you can call my office or email my office and we'll give you information with how to get in touch with them. So anyway, that is the male hormone profile from Diagnostex and hopefully a nice overview of what it means to you and the value that it can give you when you're trying to determine whether or not you have low testosterone and what you're going to choose to do about it. So that was it. Hope it made sense to you. Please feel free to leave comments and ask questions. I will do my best to answer them as quickly as I can. Thank you for watching as always, and I'll see you on the next video.